<laughs> I now know how to motivate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's to bribe them. Okay? Bribe them with something. Fine, let's quickly read uh, the first three commandments. I'm dealing with the third one. But we'll begin with verse 1. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing favor to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that you give to us on a weekly basis to meet like this, our students, faculty, and those who are involved in administration, that we might quieten our hearts before you, that you, O oh Lord, might speak to us, saving us and sanctifying us so that you might be glorified through each one of us. We ask that you might do so even now as we quieten our hearts before your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've already been given something of uh, the summary of the Ten Commandments collectively. We've also been given something of the breakdown, and I'm glad that uh, we are on the same page. Remember what we were told a few minutes ago, that this is not just words that are stuck somewhere in the Bible, but these are words that represent what God would have been teaching his children from the time Adam and Eve first got onto the planet. In other words, these words were first of all put in the hearts of those uh, first parents, and then those same words have now been, in many ways, summarized in these Ten Commandments. The words are in the human conscience, and therefore there is no excuse for anybody finally on the day of judgment to say that, well, I didn't know, and that's why I lived in sin. Well, God gave us his conscience, and the conscience tells us when we do right and when we do wrong. You've been told and quite rightly so, that the commandments are divided into two, uh, four that deal with our duty towards God, and six that deal with our duty towards others. Now, strictly speaking, the fifth commandment is a bridging commandment, just as the tenth commandment is also a bridging commandment. And what I mean by that is that, strictly speaking, if you look at Commandment 5, which talks about obeying your parents, it's not really representing loving your neighbor uh, because of the fact that you, your parents are authoritatively over you. So they are representing God in your life. 
they are, it is a bridging commandment in the sense that it is now taking you into our duty towards one another. I said exactly the same thing with the 10th commandment, which says you shall not covet your neighbor's house and uh, your, your neighbor's wife and male slave and so on. You will notice that that one is primarily to do with the heart something that is happening inside you, whereas when you deal with all the others that are above, murder, committing adultery, stealing, and bearing false testimony, you are doing something also on the outside. So, in many ways, what you have in the first five, rather than just the first four, is the worship of God. You have the first one, as has already been pointed out, the object of worship. The second one is how you worship or the matter of worship. And then the third is the manner which we are dealing with in this session. And then you proceed with when, and then lastly, deal with the custodians of worship. And the custodians of worship uh, the, the parents, or with respect to church these days, it is your church leaders who are the custodians of worship. When Israel came together as a nation, it was also the priests who were in the temple who were custodians of worship. So if you do not respect them, then inevitably, whom you see, then inevitably you cannot respect God whom you cannot see. Well, we are now plunging into the third. And when you look at the third commandment, it is essentially divided into two sections. First of all, you have the direct command. And the direct command is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And then you have the second which is the incentive, an incentive that is given to you, and it is a negative incentive. It is a warning about punishment. And it says there, For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Let's quickly begin then with the first part, which is the actual injunction. Some versions say, you shall not misuse or misuse the name of the Lord your God. And that's essentially what this passage is talking about. It, when it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Generally speaking, when we speak about names, when we think about our own names, they do not say much about our character, okay? Because they are given to us at birth, and our parents are simply expressing something of their own desires as they are giving us our names. And so, for instance, you may have been given the name Christian, and yet you never get converted. You get the point? you end up in hell. And so, obviously, we will not have Christians in hell. But you understand what it means. They meant a lot. It meant a lot to them, and so they gave you the name. Sometimes it's a little close to you. In other words, you are born and you look beautiful, and they call you beauty. You see what I mean? Uh, it wasn't just hopeful, but they saw it in you when they're giving you that name. Uh, most of us, as we've been growing up, we've tried to discover what our names mean, isn't it? Okay, I discovered my name means a bold counselor. And I've been hoping, okay, maybe I should live up to the name Conrad. I'm not exactly sure that my parents knew what they were thinking about when they gave me that name. 
simply that my grand, great-grandfather fought in some of the world wars and therefore got to know some Germans and loved the name Conrad. And so it's been passed on since then. So they're just tags that are given to us. But that's not the case with God. God, nobody gave him the name. Instead, he not only gave himself those names, but passed them on to us so that we might know how to call him. And in giving us such names, it is because he wants to reflect to us something of his character. Something of his character. So that when we are speaking in terms of who he is, as we mention his name, it is bringing to our own minds something of who God is. And so we have names like Adonai, We've got names like Elohim and so on that are actually there in the Bible itself. The names are a little hidden now because we generally operate from English Bibles. However, the reason why God revealed such names to us was so that we might know something of his person and something of his character. So, for instance, if we can go to chapter 3, very quickly, Exodus and chapter 3, this is the way God was speaking to Moses in chapter 3 and uh, verse 14. Let's begin with verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. And I'll say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Now, that's really making life difficult, isn't it? To say to people that, you know, I am has sent me. <laughs> or I am who I am has sent me. But I think the point that God was conveying ultimately to Moses were at least two thoughts. First of all, that strictly speaking, nothing in the whole of creation can appropriately represent me. Nothing. So the best representation of me is who? Me. So I am who I am. The rest of us can somehow be represented by so many others because we are part of creation. But God is altogether different. So ultimately, I am who I am. Full stop. But secondly, in this name, I am who I am, we have something of uh, God's, I'll use a, a big term here, but we will break it down, eternality. In other words, he is ever present. He does not belong to the period of time. And so this phrase is in the present, and yet it is continually in the present. Before creation, I am who I am. In time, I am who I am. In eternity, I am who I am. He never changes. He's ever the same from eternity to eternity. The unchangeable, eternal God has sent me to you. 
Okay, so there's already something there that is revealing God himself. Let me quickly quote to you one of the most famous commentators in the Bible, of the Bible rather, uh, is a Puritan called Matthew Henry. He says this, The third commandment concerns the manner of our worship, that it be done with all possible reverence and seriousness. And then I'll quote another commentator in a moment. But the point there that when therefore God is saying to us, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, or you will not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What it is saying to us then is that God, as he has revealed himself, we must never play around with that. Let me say it again. God, as he has revealed himself, we must never play with that. We must have reverence and we must also have seriousness. As we are relating to him as he has revealed himself. This also ties in with another commentary, the Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary, both of these will probably be in your library. They are very common, but they are classics. They are historic ones. And this is what that commentary says. All light and irreverent use of the name, now notice, the titles, the attributes, the works of God, or anything that is his, Have you noticed that? It's no longer just the name, but the title, the attributes. In other words, what we consider to be characteristics of God, the works of God, his decrees, creation, providence, as he's ruling the whole of history. And then they add, and anything that is his. In other words, Even when we think in terms of church, because church is his. Worship, when we are there, all that belongs to him. That we must do so with utmost respect, with seriousness, with reverence, to borrow the words of Matthew Henry. Let me quickly hurry on to say this. That because... We use the name of God when we are making vows, when we are making pledges. For instance, when a person is inducted into the position of a minister or a permanent secretary, you will notice that they hold the Bible like this in their hands as they are reading their pledge. Similarly, When you go to court, the same thing happens. You are given the Bible to hold, and you say, I'm going to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You may add, so help me God, but even if you don't add that, the fact that you are holding something that belongs to him, we are already being told that we must do so with utmost seriousness. You are not to do it, and then in your mind, you are, you've already prepared the lies that you are going to, for, to say in court. No, no, no. You are to do so knowing that I've just made a vow, a pledge, in the name of God, and therefore I must do it seriously. So this is what this commandment is primarily all about. Everything to do with God, we must do so seriously. Now, because of the way I've opened it up, it means that we can apply it in many areas, in many ways, and I just don't have time 
to open that up. So an obvious example would be being absent-minded when you are worshipping. So you are there singing, crown him with many crowns. Eh? And then your mind is thinking in terms of what will I eat for lunch? Now that's automatically saying you are playing with that which is so important. Okay. Or you're supposed to be praying to God. Praying to God. But you are with your mind thinking about everything else or texting your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, about happy Valentine, but you are supposed to be praying. Are we together? Huh? I'm hearing yes this side, but quietness this side. <laughs> are we together? Uh-huh. So when you come to do anything to do with God, you have to discipline yourself and discipline your mind knowing that this is very important. That I'm not to play with the things that belong to God. Very quickly, the second part. I could go on into further. The second part of this commandment, as we saw, is like the previous one. The previous one also threatens punishment. Hmm? It said there in um, verse 5, halfway through, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children of, um, on the third and fourth generation. So it threatens punishment there. Strictly speaking, even verse 12 about honor your father and your mother, when it says, so that your days may be long on the land which the Lord your God is giving you, is actually also giving us the exact opposite. That if we do not honor our father and our mother, we will not live long in the land that we are being given. But thankfully, that one is given in a positive way. But these two are in the negative, And they threaten that punishment is going to come upon you. Now, in the Old Testament, assuming you actually blasphemed the name of God, there was a clear punishment in Leviticus and uh, chapter, um, I think it's for 24. Leviticus 24, and it's really that you were to be stoned. Hmm? You were to be stoned. Leviticus 24 and verse 16. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger as well as the native when he blasphemes, the name shall be put to death. Now, that's obviously bringing out the seriousness of this matter. Especially that it is saying that everybody must participate. The congregation. Eh? Imagine stoning your brother or your sister or your father, or your mother, or your son, or your daughter. That's hard. That's tough. But that's God trying to send a message of waste punishment in eternity if we play around with his name. Now, the Israelites were, were so, uh, what's the word? They, they were so afraid of this reality that they stopped using God's name. Hmm? They stopped using God's name. 
They never mentioned God's name. Literally. That by the time Jesus was coming on the scene, guess what? They had forgotten God's name. So up to now, they don't, they don't know God's name. Now, in writing, it was there. But because in writing, they didn't have the vowels. They only had the consonants. I'm sure you know vowels and consonants. Hey. Some of you are looking blank. Okay. Because they didn't have the vowels, they do have the name, for instance, which we now call Yahweh, eh? or Jehovah. They have the consonants there in the Bible. But because they lost the vowels, that's how come nobody knows the exact pronunciation of God's name. So what they began to do in order to escape this tricky situation is that they began to, to swear indirectly. Hmm? Indirectly. And that's what Jesus was addressing. Let's quickly go to Matthew. Um, let me see which one I can use for lack of time. When should I wrap up? You know, I've been missing for quite some time. When does channel chapter finish? I hope it's not five minutes ago. <laughs> what time is it supposed to end? It's supposed to end at 12.30, but we'll be a <laughs> Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try and finish in five minutes. Yeah, you know, when people are missing from action, they come back, they tend to go on too long. Okay, let me see if uh, chapter 5, verse 33, um, yeah, I think it's good enough. Chapter 5 and verse 33. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I said to you, take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is forced to, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. The whole point there is that that's what they were now swearing by. To keep away from swearing by the name of God itself directly. And Jesus is saying, even that don't do, because ultimately, as he says later on in chapter 23, you are still swearing by God himself. After all, it is associated with God. So, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Okay, so let me quickly wrap up there. The point that is being mentioned here is that we need to take the things of God seriously. Whatever it is that is about God, we must do so seriously. Going to church? Take it seriously. Hmm? Be on time. Prepare. Concentrate. And when God has spoken, ask, what has he said to me? And whatever it is, put it into practice. That shows you really respect him. When you pray alone, we've already talked about that. When you're reading the Bible, again the same thing. This belongs to him. So take it seriously. Let me close for us in prayer. Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder that it's not just the object of worship that is important. It's not just the various parts of worship that are important, the elements of worship, but also the attitude with which we come to worship. Help us to do so seriously and with reverence that anything that has to do with your self-revelation, help us 
to do so with genuine respect because you are God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for your patience and indulgence. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Conrad. We are truly blessed.